everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. For us at Bridging Heaven and Earth, this is the first new show we've shot in the, in the new millennium, in the year 2000. And what is the message again in this new millennium? And what will be the, ne the message in the next millennium? I was just joking with a friend who had this slogan, One Day in Peace, January 1st, 2000. When he came into the studio, I said, well, we've got to change it to One Day in Peace, January 3000. And so, but what does it mean? We started this show in, in 1995. We started it, and this is our 92nd show, and we've been going on for you know, almost five years now. And the message is always the same. The message is dedicated to the oneness. Now, what does that mean? It means that it's t it, just, it was the time, it will be the time, and it's always the time for each of us as human beings on this planet to experience that connection, that connection to the whole, that feeling that that there is no ever, no ever, never can be a separation between any of us and any other living, sentient being on this, on this planet and anywhere else. It's that connection, that life force that is the same life force that, that drives us all. And what we see sometimes is the separations and the differences are no different than seeing that somebody's wearing a, a brown shirt versus a red shirt versus a blue shirt. And we think the colors of our skin, our national nationalities, our countries, all those things are the separations between us and the reasons that we shouldn't agree, that we can't agree. But if, if this time, if this millennium is what it's supposed to be, and I'm sure it is because I can feel it within me, it's a time for us to come together. It's a time for us to experience the love that connects us all. Because when human beings experience that deepest connection, that thing that we call in different spiritual paths, God, the truth, trans the transcendental experience, Brahman, whatever it might be, that in a human body it feels like love, it feels like bliss. And for us here at Bridging Heaven and Earth, we're just so excited to, to start another season where we have 13 more shows of people coming in truly from all over the world to bring their love and their dedication with you and, and through their love back to that experience over and over again for them and for you. So once again, we're just so honored to have you with us and to, to start a new season. And this season, we're starting off with a truly extraordinary show. We have Val John Ferris with us. He's a spiritual anthropologist. He's a behavioral scientist. He travels the world exploring ancient ru ruins and mystical cultures. He's written an extraordinary new book, Inca Fire, Light of the Masters. And just, you'll see that his being is someone who's come to experience that love. And, and his life is dedicated to experiencing that love. So, and we also have with us Suzanne Tang, who's a mystical flutist, she's a teacher, she's a master world musician, and she has an extraordinary new CD out called Mystic Journey. So once again, we're just extremely delighted to have all of you with us again and to have just a chance to share that love with you again. I mean, you don't know how excited we are to, to be back and to, to have that love available for us. So. So please join me in a short meditation, then we'll begin with Susan doing a piece with her partner Gilbert, and it's just going to be an extraordinary ring. So settle in, sit down, relax, and just let this night carry you. So please join me in a short meditation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let this next hour, whatever you've done all day, let this next hour be dedicated to the oneness, to the love that connects us all, that really is us all. So we're going to start tonight's show with uh, Topanga Dreams by Suzanne Tang. She wrote it as performed by Suzanne and Gilbert Levy. So whenever you're ready, please.
Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Well, we're on the set with Val John. Welcome. So, in your experience, you've had from your book, I mean, just extraordinary experiences as you've traveled this earthly body. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have described something as your book, like the subtext of your book, Light of the Masters. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk about that a little? Sure. I, uh, one of the things I really love is, is your conversation about the connectedness and the love and the divinity. And the Light of the Masters really is that. It's about the connectedness, it's about the relatedness. Um, and in all the places that I've been around the world, I've been to lots of wonderful places. I probably have one of the best jobs in the world. And really, a spiritual anthropologist doesn't mean anything more than I just love the divine and I love finding out about it and, and being with people from all walks of life and all places on the earth. And I've been privileged to come into contact of this connectedness and this unity and this love. And, and it's everywhere. It's all over the earth. And, and How could it be otherwise? It, it's growing. Right. It's growing. Yeah. So, and you had specific experiences of that that gave you certain either uh, tools or certain ways of looking at things. Why don't you talk about that a little? Yeah, they were far beyond tools. I was, in, I'm, I'm just inspired. I am truly inspired by the things that have occurred. And um, words can't really express them, but I'm going to try my best to. It's to a talk them. show. That's, that's what that's we tried right. to do. That's here. exactly right. <laughs> All right, we're done. Can't be uh, yeah. talked about. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a book, read it, we'll see you later. No. The Light of the Masters, I, I guess, in really speaking about it in a way that, that makes sense and, and communicates the experience, was it was like a Moses experience. I, I went to the top of this summit uh, in, in uh, Peru, and this was a year and a half ago, and this was my, one of my last adventures that I've gone on, and I spent the night under the full moon on this high pinnacle above the clouds, and above the Machu Picchu ruins that were built by the Incas in the 1300s. And I spent 14 hours having revelations about this master's light. Wow. And what occurred... You didn't see a burning bush. No, then. no. So it wasn't no, just it wasn't, like... It wasn't a burning right, bush, but, I, but I'll tell you no. what, there were flames. Uh -huh, and the, right. fl the flames that I experienced were this essential fire, this essential light that exists in all things and all people, and, and the Inca, not only the Inca, but many civilizations around the world have referred to light and this inner light, this inner fire, this inner flame, inner wisdom. And the light of the masters, Alan, is an inner wisdom that exists inside of me, it exists inside of you, it exists inside of every viewer that's watching our show, all of our, our wonderful guests and crew, uh, in all things. And this light of the masters, when one comes into contact with it, totally and completely revolutionizes their life. There are seven facets that, that uh, I was um, in the privilege of this night. And one the first, for two hours for each one? Two <laughs> hours for each one, and it was. It was I mean, it was really specifically like It was two hours for each one. Now, now listen, I wasn't on drugs, and there was no alcohol involved. This was a, like a If pure, anybody believes that, we have... This was a pure experience. What we got an elevator pair so we could now, sell you. Honestly, really. Now, here's what happened. So let me tell you what happened. So I climbed the summit, right? This is after dark, and I, I breached the security fence, and I waited until the security sweep was finished in the, in the ruins, and I just hid there and waited, and I climbed up to the top of the summit, and there's this altar at the top of Huayna Peak. We have a, a, a video of that a little later yeah, on, right? Yeah, we're going to show it to you. Right, okay, good. Carved in the rock is this, it looks like the nest of a condor. In fact, I think condors did roost there. But, but centuries ago, the Inca shamans and the priests and the priestesses did ceremonies at this place. So I slide into this spot, right? And I'm going to spend the night. Did you know this was there before, or did no, you just stumble no onto idea. it? No, it pulled me. It pulled you. It pulled me. Right. It wasn't a stumble. So in other words, like you were at this place, and it said, go hide. Absolutely. All it's the way, time to hide. I, I, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, and that's it. what I did. All right, right? I get it. So I get just in, being clear. I, so. so listen, I get into this place, though, and I touch this altar, and all of a sudden, these flames burst out. Now, it, it was more like a visualization. You know that, you know that space between sleep and when you're awake, it's kind of like that, that dreamy state, right? right? Well, it was like that, and these flames came up all around me in my experience, and these seven flames, these seven emanations um, came into my experience. And the first emanation of the light of the masters is humility. And it, it's one, one of the emanations that I really need to work on most for myself is, is humility, and I found it to You think very, that's why it came first? I think so. I think, I think it's the first <laughs> lesson, right? The second emanation of the Light of the Masters is eternality. 
And it's that, that eternal part of us, that part of us that although we can be hurt, we can be wounded, we can be disappointed, we will always endure and we will always survive. And the soul is literally indestructible. That's the second facet or emanation of the light of the masters. Third one is truth. One of my favorites because truth doesn't let you get away with anything. It says this is the way it is, whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, this is how it is. And, and how, what, I mean, on what level is truth this? Truth is, you know, it's like a rose, a rose, a rose. Like, so what, how does it refer to in that? I think the, the way it was delivered to me was that truth is, it is, can be a relative thing, but ultimate truth is that there is no truth you can believe other than being true to yourself, being true to your own nature, is being it, true. Would you say it's an experience of harmony as you proceed? Not, not always. Sometimes uh, truth can be chaos, and I think our ability to endure chaos um, will bring us truth, uh, mm -hmm. just as much as our ability to endure harmony. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth one is passion, and uh, I probably like that dimension the most, not because it's just about desire or lust, but literally because passion is about inspiration and aspiration. Um, it's about creativity. Yeah, it's right. the celebration that we are connected, like you were and, saying, and that we're in physical bodies. Yeah, absolutely, right. and to be able to celebrate all the facets, everything from heaven to earth, and everything in between. Right, right? but no lower. No, you want to go lower. Oh, than okay, that. just check. That's another show. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's coming. We're, we got an offshoot coming on. <laughs> Actually, people have said this show is bridging heaven and hell sometimes. <laughs> but but we, hopefully not tonight. There you go. So sovereignty is the fifth emanation. Sovereignty is, to be sovereign means to reign alone. It means to, to thine own self be true, basically. And you come, in that sense, you come in alone and you go out alone. That's right. Even though we're all connected. That's right. And, right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then faith is the sixth emanation or dimension of knowing as it was uh, delivered to me. And faith um, exists beyond belief. Faith is a, really a pure experience that um, when one has faith, they no longer need belief. You know, right. it's kind of like belief is like a ladder you climb until right. you get to the platform of faith and you kick the ladder free. Now, would you, how would you deal with like faith and experience? Is there a certain connection between that? Yeah, I, I think one of the things about faith is when I am able to embrace my experience, regardless of what it is, whether it's a good experience, a bad an experience, an experience I think I should have or that I shouldn't have, faith gives you the, the, the courage and strength to be able to embrace experience, whether it's something that's blissful or, or terrible or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And what's the next one? The last one is service, and it's what, it's what ties all the other six together. It's what you're doing on this show. It's providing a service for people where you're making a contribution, you're offering something that will make a difference to people. And service is really a, a very sweet and divine phenomenon because in the act of serving, you're giving freely. There's no strings, there's no obligation. It's where I'm giving something to you, and as I give to you, you also give to me. So there's no roles. It's not like I'm the server and you're the servee. It's a synergy right. kind of thing. Right. Okay, you know, I think it's about time. Why don't we show that video yeah. so you could do that? Great, uh, that way I can show so, you a little Peru. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever we're ready with the video, let's do it. It's, uh, let, me, let me go over it. It's a video by, it's an Inca rune video by uh, Val John. And Suzanne uh, is going to do a, a medicine wheel. Uh, she has written this song and it's performed by Suzanne and Gilbert Levy. So whenever we're ready with the video. And then Val John is going to describe the video and what happened to it with, uh, with Suzanne and Gilbert playing in the background. Urumbamba Valley, high in the Andes, is home to the Inca people, a mysterious race that merges nature, cosmology, and spirituality into a harmonious existence. This majestic valley is also the home of Machu Picchu, the crown jewel of the Inca Empire. Built in the 1300s, Machu Picchu means wise, old bird of spirit. And it's a sanctuary of the soul. 
It's a pinnacle of the heart. It's a land where the gods do dance and the deities do sing. Legend has it that the Inca built this place to be an altar for receiving an ancient wisdom called the Light of the Masters. It was here among these ancient stones that I experienced this Master's Light. The light of the masters possesses seven emanations or dimensions of knowing. They are humility, eternality, truth, passion, sovereignty, faith, and service. Consistent with the Inca theology, these seven dimensions of light exist within all things, thus connecting them together and unifying heaven and earth, man and beast, nature and mind. We too can experience the grace, the wonder, and the wisdom held within the light of the Masters. 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 Wow, that was beautiful. So, I mean, I guess there are people in the audience, you know, probably out of the you know, 12 million people are watching at this moment. There are probably like a couple of million who are saying, okay, there are these 12 facets. They sound like good ideas. Mm -hmm. How? How do I do that? How does it manifest for me? I think one of the best ways to, to talk about it is there's a difference between the emanations or, or the dimensions and just simply principles. Like a lot of people know the words humility or eternality even or truth or faith or passion. But these things as emanations or dimensions carried by the light have far more power. Do you know how sometimes um, you can think that being humble is the right thing to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are? That's not one of mine. <laughs> it doesn't come out well, very often. So. We need to spend some time on the first dimension. Right. right. <laughs> But for who? Yeah, you or me? for both of us. That's right. It's a shared experience, right? Remember, it's, we're connected. Right. All right. So, so as but as a dimension, humility will bring us to our knees. I want to share just a, just a short story to to illuminate to the power of one of the dimensions, if I can. Please. Um, during this night at the summit of this of this uh, pinnacle, these experiences came to me and sent me back into places in my life. So the light of the masters exists inside of all of us. These seven emanations exist in us. So during this 14 hours, two hours at a time, I was sent back into places in my life where these experiences were given to me, these dimensions, right? So I flash back on this other mountain that I climbed with 32 other climbers, and we climbed Mount Shasta. 
and I'm up at 11,500 feet, and it's an ice climb, so I have the ice crampons on my, vo my boots, and I've got the ice axes and the whole deal. Well, we're traversing this huge fissure in the ice, and we had just zigzagged across it, and we're climbing up a steep 60-degree slope, and the crampon popped off of my left boot. And I lost my footing, fell onto my back, and I started sliding down the glacier, and I was going to die. Well, what happened was my fellow climbers had made a human net, and they caught me about four feet before I went over the edge. Wow. And I was stunned. I was glad to be alive. But you know what? I was also very uncomfortable because I had to be vulnerable. And I don't know about you, but for me, humility and vulnerability, the whole idea of being So open, what was the problem with vulnerability, that somebody saved you? Yeah, because I wanted to help myself. I didn't want to put anybody out. I didn't want to obligate them. Right? I didn't Did you not want to obligate them or yourself that you owed them something? Or? Yeah, I didn't want to owe them anything. And, what I re and where I really got this, this dimension of, of humility, though, that was just a crack. Where it really happened was at the summit at 13,162 feet. You didn't fall again. No, I didn't fall again. But I'll tell you what, I fell to my knees. Because <laughs> maybe this isn't... <laughs> listen, to the sec listen to the second fall. You think yeah. the, the second fall was really what was powerful. You know, at the top of every great mountain, there's a register book. And at the top of Mount Shasta, it's in a green canister under the northwest crag. And in this register book is, is a diary of all the climbers who've climbed since like 1920. So I opened the book, Alan, to this spot, 1972, October 21st, I'll never forget it, and it was a dedication from a son to his father. And this was where I got the emanation of humility. And it went like this, Father, today I'm standing at the top of Mount Shasta, and it's because of your love and your heart and your courage that I was able to be at the top of this great mountain. And although you lost your legs in the Korean War, and you were never able to stand beside me as I was growing up as your son, Father, I want you to know that today I climb this mountain for both of us. I love you with all of my heart and all of my soul, your son John. And I closed that book, and I fell to my knees in humility. And that's the power that these seven emanations have. When you're really open to them, they will change your life. And so how would somebody be open to them? I think one of the first things to do is to be aware. Um, it's hard enough just to be aware of humility, let alone set six other ones. But to be aware, what I did when I came down off the mountain, I was inspired. But you know, I also had to struggle because these are not really easy to engage with. So on Monday, Monday was humility day. Tuesday was eternality day. Do you think that's why there were seven? I, I don't know. I, and you never get to rest in this one. No, absolutely not. There's no rest. See, there's no right. days off in right. life. Right. <laughs> Brutal. It is. Brutal. Really? I, you know, the Bible said that, you know, rest on the seven, so I've been working on that all. <laughs> now right. I found out, no wonder. There isn't any rest. Yeah. Okay. For okay. the wicked or for the great. That's what I hear. Yeah. yeah. Not being either one. It <laughs> doesn't come up very often. Yeah. Really. So yeah, it, it, they're tough. But you know what? If you, if you put your mind to it and if you think, now so in conversations, am I being humble? Just by asking that question. You know, I wrote down the word humble for, for Monday and the eternality. Is humble something that can be uh, understood or is it an experience of something or a lack of experience of I something? I think you can understand humility, but I don't think that'll get you there. I think you actually have to fall to your knees and feel the experience. That's when its full power is available. And, and so, do you think that that's a building momentum to make that real for you? Yeah, definitely. So that's, it's just opening up to it and experiencing it more and more. Absolutely, because now I'm more open. So when things happen in my life, when people try to share things with me, I'm open to them. I'll allow myself to feel a vulnerability. And there's a sense of compassion also that when you open to humility, it really opens your heart and your soul. And I, um, you know, the more I get around with, uh, with people all over the world, the more opportunities I have to be humble. And I'm humbled a lot by people, and it's a wonderful gift. And it's not easy to do, but you can do it if you just put your mind to it. Wow, something to look forward to. <laughs> uh, okay, I guess, you know, we'll take a break now, and we'll do the uh, second Suzanne set. Uh, the second set, Suzanne, and all these the songs that she did in the first set and the second set are from her uh, new CD, Mystic Journey. It's a magnificent piece and just really inspiring. So the first song is going to be Fertile Crescent, written and performed by Suzanne and, and Gilbert Levy. And then she's going to do China Lily, uh, which is uh, written by Suzanne and performed by Gilbert and Suzanne. So whenever they're ready, Fertile Crescent and China Lily. Thank you.
Wow, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Gilbert. That was beautiful, beautiful that wasn't was it? Wonderful. Really, that was really spectacular. Mm. So, would you say that these seven facets are, uh, are pieces of something else? I mean, is something at the root of that? Yeah. I mean, isn't that where we want to go? I think so. Okay. Yeah. And how would you describe that? Well, you know, as it was kind of delivered to me was that the light of the masters is really that ultimate unity, that connectedness, that the remembrance of not just God, but the remembrance of who we are as expressions of God. And so that place to aspire to is not just a blissful place, but a human place. So I think kind of where it leads is to really that bridge between being spiritual and also being a human being and how to tie those two together. Well, do you think it's probably we have concepts about being what spiritual is with a, you know, a gruel bowl and... Right. So, I mean, that people, I mean, masters have always been thought of as like weird at the time. Sure. I mean, we look back and, you know, Jesus is wonderful now and Buddha is wonderful and at the time, you know, they had... One was crucified, one had like eight followers. Hey, there's you know, a track like, record yeah. for you. Yeah, right. It was a very poor <laughs> showing, as they That's say, right. in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot misunderstood. For a lot of, you know, a lot of people are really seeking now. They're searching. They're looking to see really what for them is the light of the masters. Because the light of the masters isn't something out there. The light of the masters exists inside of each human being, each soul, and each of us has the responsibility of aspiring or looking there and finding out for ourselves what that means. Even in the face of, of people not agreeing or maybe persecuting us or thinking we've got the wrong ideas, but you know, to, to continue to be true to ourselves and seek out that light is really the, the, uh, the task, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you travel the world bringing this message, and you bring it, interestingly enough, to c general corporations. I mean, not just right. going on, basically, there's a spiritual talk show and right. you know, it has a certain audience, uh, but you take it to big corporations like Hewlett Packard and Xerox That's and companies right. like that. Which is a wonderful opportunity. And, and what was your response there? Well, you know, sometimes you get crucified, sometimes you have to walk into the river and drown, um, right. but every time you keep being true to yourself. And one of the interesting things about uh, corporate, not just America, but corporate world is that uh, they really are seeking something more substantive. They don't want just the, the motivational programs and the conflict resolution. I mean, the fact that they're even bringing somebody like you right. in whose message is more esoteric or more spiritual, and whatever you know, those words I mean. talk about reverence. You know, they hire me to go in and talk to their managers and their executives about reverence. And reverence literally means to hold in high regard and is sacred. And I make no bones about it. I go right in there and talk about reverence with people. And, and reverence, is there a, an object to the reverence? Or is it just to feel reverent? The, no, there's an object. And I think the object is, first off, to have a reverence for oneself. Um, many people don't hold themselves in high regard. Um, and that's really where it starts. But then it's also to hold others in high regard. And you, you know what's wonderful about reverence, too, is you don't necessarily even have to like someone or believe their ways to hold them in high regard. And that's the key message that, that global corporations are looking for now, is how to create harmony and connectedness between people from different cultures, from, from different walks of life, to do commerce together. And that's right. the key to being able to discuss spirituality and reverence in the global marketplace today. Because it's actually, it actually works as a corporate strategy, it does. in essence, because Absolutely. people have to get along. Because it's, would you say it's because the world is becoming a smaller place between yeah. e-commerce and the Internet, and oh, yeah. there's no time and space on the Internet? There is none. And, and all of the barriers are broken down. You can be one individual and make as much of an influence and contribution as a, a large corporation. So there's a lot of barriers that are broken down, and that is facilitating the coming of spirit. It's good news. They, That's fantastic. It's very news. good news. Yeah. I'm so I'm I'm very thrilled to be involved in it, both in that domain and here with you. I mean, this is very good news. <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah. fantastic. So as you travel the world, you're seeing that a real influx of, however we're going to, you know, like you said at the beginning, it's hard to use words, but that experience of spirit, that desire for spirit, that yeah. desire for the light of the masters, that yeah. desire for truth, yeah. or whatever words you would use. Absolutely, everywhere I go. And, and it's not so much that there's like a revolution for bliss and, and, and divinity and all that, but people are looking for ways to hold common human experiences. How do you hold the loss of your mother? 
or the loss of your father. How do you, how do you deal with the breakup of a family? The common things, the things that we have to deal with every day. How, how do we engage in, in, a, in a respectful way, in a way that's going to create something good to come even out of all these bad right. things? You know, I was in, I was in um, Colorado when they had that shooting um, at that school. I actually had some managers who had children in that very school, and I was leading a course with them. And it was, it was so tumultuous. Of course, they, none of their kids were, were hurting, right. but, but they were concerned. And how do you deal? How do you find God? How do you find spirit right in the midst of tragedy? And I think that's what people are, are seeing, is that you don't have to have just bliss, but you can find spirit in everything from bliss to tragedy and everything in between. What we define as those things. So it's that, that full spectrum, that wide spectrum. You know, it was Meister Eckhart. I love this guy. He got burned at the stake like, like a lot of those who were willing to step out, right? right. But, but while he was alive, he wrote some great stuff. And he had this one quote that I just really love. And um, it goes like this. The deeper the hole thou dig in thine life, the higher the mound of earth that rises to the heavens. And I just love that quote. <laughs> Actually, it's a funny story because he said the same quote at lunch. I won't say what you. And I won't about. say what my comment was either because it's being a family show. But uh, if, if you in the audience would like to take a shot at it, you could, who've known me a while, you could probably figure it out where yeah, I went with really. that. But uh, yeah. so, where do you see yourself heading? Do you see yourself writing more books, or is this like? You, the information's out, and you're just going to spread it and hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm heading all around the world. I'm doing Light of the Masters events. Um, I'm talking with people about the seven dimensions. I'm doing seminars. I'm doing book signings, radio, television. I'm, I'm on a mission to, to make this information available because I found it to be so clean, so pristine, and so powerful, and actually not that complicated. If you can think of humility and, let's say, um, sovereignty together, if you just use those two. See, one of the things is there are a lot of people who are sovereign. They're true to their self, but they're legends in their own mind. Yeah, I think I've heard of that. Right? Yeah. But now imagine this. Imagine adding another dimension of humility that checks the ego. So now you can see how these dimensions work together. So one counterbalances another. So you have humility here. You have sovereignty here. That provides that balance, right? So you don't go out of hand with being mm -hmm. true to yourself. But then if you add, let's say, uh, a, a dimension of faith. Now, not only are you sovereign, which is in command of your own life, and not only are you humble, but you also aspire to a higher order and you surrender yourself to something greater than yourself. So it adds dimension, it adds power. And the more dimensions you begin to add, it creates more stability in your life. It's a wonderful set of tools for strengthening yourself, for deepening your, your faith and your spirituality, and also for being more authentic as a human being. And, and would you say that as you rub up against the magnet of all these facets, that you get to the root of where the facets come from? Because we're only talking about definitions of, we're cutting apart the infinite and sure. talking about it. Right. I get magnetized. You know, what can I tell you? I rub up against it and I get magnetized and, and it leads me into the field and right in that magnetic field I find something that I can't describe. So I wind up like at the beginning of the show not knowing what to say. <laughs> You've managed, thank God. <laughs> Once again, no, it's, I mean, people, you know, talk to me about the guests and I say, well, you know, they all have just had tremendous experience or, you know, 99.9 percent. .9%. And, you know, basically, once they relax, I mean, they could talk from now till, you know, next June, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, there really isn't a problem yeah, that way. So, nice. uh, how has there been the reception to the book? Good. I've gotten great reviews, um, even from the Midwest. I mean, you know, the, there mm -hmm. are a number of people who thought it was a little strange at first, but you know what? After they read the book, they actually saw that there was a, a method to them. Well, in a way, it's, you know, dealing with, like, as you said, human... Right human needs and human desire. Everybody knows that, you know, being, having faith is right. good. Yeah, you know? so the reviews have been great, and I've been, uh, there's a lot of encouragement for it. I'm, I'm excited about it, and people are embracing it, and, and um, I'm having a wonderful time with it. Now, I mean, a lot of spiritual paths, if you could call this a spiritual path, just because we're using sure. words again, yeah, uh, have a quiet thing or a meditation or something of that nature. Does yeah. this have any f part of that? No. No, no you see, Meditation is wonderful. It's great for, for getting in touch with the silence and a peace and inside yourself and the connectedness and all that. One of the things about the seven dimensions is they're user-friendly in terms of your day-to-day -day life. So you can actually, right in the middle of a conversation, check to see if you're being true to yourself. Right in the middle of a conversation. And how do you know? 
you, just by asking, you know, one of the ways I know, uh, like, for example, for, for about a six-week period, I worked on humility, right? What's interesting about it is if you will hold this idea of humility in your mind, let's say you're driving in traffic, you begin to discover all the places where you're not being humble. They uh -huh. show up like a Now, but isn't it against the definition of humbleness? I mean, how, do you, at what point do you have the experience of humbleness that you can compare it to? I, I think it, it's not so much that. It's when you begin to notice your arrogance. That, so in noticing the arrogance, it reminds you to not be that way. But arrogance is another definition. I mean, would, would people have said, I mean, would the Sanhedrin have said Jesus was arrogant, who said he was the son of God, which, hello, right. a little arrogant maybe. But was he telling the truth? Was he true to himself in that way? Right. So, I mean, it, what is arrogant? How, you see, I'm saying, I mean, yeah. we have to have an experience of harmony to know what disharmony is. You can define disharmony till yeah. you puke. Sure. And everybody will have a different one, and it'll be arbitrary, and then, then you'll have holy wars. Yeah. Over. Well, we do. We are going to, whether we do this or not. That's, oh, that's that's, probably not oh good. <laughs> <laughs> but now, when? Do I have time to eat? No. <laughs> you know, I think, I think it's, it's a personal experience for everybody. And, and if you really look at the seven dimensions, if you study them a little bit, if you think about them, if you reflect on them, you will know whether you're being humble or not. Inside your own heart, you will know. Now, some people are very thick and very dense, and they don't know anything. Um, in terms of their own self-awareness. And this, this really isn't for people who have no insight into themselves or into what these things mean. Okay, well, the crew in the, in the audience is just now. finished now. Be but. careful. <laughs> Everyone but Alan should read my book. <laughs> right. right. I have it in front of me, however, so... <laughs> Michael? So this is the book. I don't know if you saw it on one of the flyers, but, yeah, it's, it's really a powerful book. It really is. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, you know, it's just, it's just an interesting thing. I mean, it's like you know, a lot of spokes on the wheel, and, and people are drawn to different spokes. Sure. I mean, you know, I mean, it seems, you know, when you talk about it, it seems like a beautiful thing. It's just at some point we have to break, you know, the definitions leave. Yeah. And then you, you know, you're living, and you're not, you're not. There's nothing to, like, mirror it to. You are. Right. You know, like Val John is, rather than Val John is humble. When right. Val John is humble, that means Val John. You know what I mean? Yes. You become. A, a manifest, you know, walking manifestation of light, love, God, or whatever you want, rather than, you know, now I'm being humble, com you know, as opposed to two minutes ago. Was well, that? you know, I've been around the, the horn a couple of times, you know. <laughs> really I, I, around I'm the not bases. a guy who just fell off the pumpkin wagon <laughs> of, of awareness. No turn of but tree. I, but I will tell you this, I will tell you that even after, you know, once you go to the place of unity and love and peace and all that, and it's, you stop the world and all those things, then you got to return to real earth and you, you discover that you have the same behaviors you had before you were, you were transformed. And, and this material is what provides people kind of a roadmap or a guide to be able to see when they're being humble, when they're not. Um, even the greatest of people in the world, I think, are, are human beings and they have issues with faith and, and with service and, and with trust and truth. And, and so these are ways to kind of true yourself up. And there's two chapters in the book that actually talk about the behaviors that are consistent with each of these seven. So I actually break it down. So Why don't you pick one? Yeah, I you can. Know. I'm sure. We'll take, um, for example, if I, if I talk um, about um, truth, for example. So when truth is present, there's authenticity. So being authentic is when there's something on your mind, you say it the way that it is, rather than changing it for, for somebody else so that they'll like it or, or so that you know, they'll like you. or accept. And you know whether you're saying things that are authentic or not. The second one in terms of truth is groundedness. How grounded are you? How good are you at being able to stand by that which you know to be true? And then the third one is how objective are you? You know, how, how can you be objective in the middle of an argument? You see, can you be more committed to the truth in the relationship than you are to your agenda and objectivity as a way to kind of true yourself up. So there are some specific behaviors. But if you have agenda, it's going to be hard to, you know, I mean, isn't it you need, if you don't have an agenda, then you can, it's easy to be true, right? Isn't the agenda the problem, rather? Yeah, the, the agenda is. And I think <laughs> if, if you can have some objectivity about your own agenda, like, you know what, I have an agenda, and I notice I'm more committed to my agenda than I am to having right. our relationship work, right. then truth comes to you. I see. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess, you know, we've done it again, and uh, the show's coming to an end, and I, you know, definitely want to thank everybody, you know, who watched the show, and anybody who wants information on Val, John, or Suzanne, uh, workshops, books, uh, 
internet sites. Please call me, Alan, 805-687-2053. I think we had it on the, on the uh, graphics on the set before. So it's 805-687-2053. And really, I mean, we're coming into this new time. We're coming into this new millennium. It's, it's time for us to collaborate in love. It's time for us to collaborate in creativity. So please, let's all come together. There's so much that needs to be done. There's so much love. There's so much opportunity. So please join with us, and we'll join with you, and let it happen. It's time. It's now. Good night. Thank you. God bless you.